please note that this video contains spoilers. Movie thoughts. I just gotta comment on the Nixon in this movie. I love that for how few lines he has for the half of a minute that we see him where he isn't in front of someone that he doesn't, you know, that he can't be himself in front of, they fit in two swear words. That's just perfect. That is, that is Nixon right there, you know, swearing like a sailor. That, spot on. The RFK depiction, the Kennedy is, dick, you know, accent, whatever. Maybe slightly over the top, but the character was really, really, you know, accurate. I really liked the whole thing with the mother. I think that it was fantastic that we got to understand her as well. That, you know, you could... You could kind of tell... You could tell where he got some of his views from, for one thing, with, you know, one of her very first lines. One of the very first lines of the entire movie is her complaining about how, you know, African Americans, which is not the word she uses, are, you know, now thinking that they deserve rights. You know, that... But, but yeah, other than that, you know, the whole Daffy scene, I thought that was just pitch perfect. You know, all the little elements to it, he begins to stammer. It's, it's his mask that is slipping. He can't keep lying to everyone, including himself, about who he really is, what he really is. And, you know, all this brought upon by having to excuse himself, having to lie in order to not dance with a woman. The... So, so yeah, you know, he, he stammers in, you know, he, it's, it's, it's the mask slipping, you know, that, that is not, uh, his behavior is not that of a man who is just, you know, a little flustered over having been in the situation that he maybe couldn't completely handle. It is the behavior of a man who's... You know, who, who, who can't completely, you know, his, his ground has just been shaken, if you will. And he stammers, and his mother, you know, it's again, it's a very telling scene. From that one scene, we can tell that what she does when he stammers... You know, it's the same thing each time. Just repeat those sentences that the speech therapist told you to say. You know, and you hear him say them, and you realize, you know, these are these are difficult things to say. You know, they require good enunciation, and you know, yeah, you know, it's it's not just. This is something that you can say, and you know, when sometimes when people stammer, it can be easier to just repeat a sentence, you know. But it's not just repeating a sentence, it's repeating a sentence that, you know, is actually a little complex, you know, big words, and it takes some effort to say. So, you know, if you can say all that properly, then you're better at speaking, you know. And he tries. Because that's what he does. That's what he does in that situation. His face, his mask, starts to slip. She tells him, buck up and deal with it. And he tries to deal with it. That is, that is the circle. That is how it's always been. But this is... It is no longer working. And he, you know, he, he breaks through. He, he struggles and he actually stands up to his mother. That was a really strong moment, and the terrible thing is that it it doesn't work. It doesn't have any... It doesn't help him at all. And as she tells the story of 
Daffy, whose last name I can't quite remember, but, you know, this other kid, it, it illustrates so perfectly just the, the bigotry and this, you know, this destructive behavior towards minorities, and it has, you know, she, she is both subject to it and enforcing it. You know, she is, she is part of the problem, but also somewhat suffering under it, because if she wasn't suffering under it, then her son could live as himself. So, you know, but, and, and that is often how it is, you know, you, you might want something gone, but you don't feel like you can be the one person to stand up against it. And so you you choose to enforce it instead because that distracts people from, you know, then, well, then that person can't possibly be part of this problem because, you know, they're trying to solve it. So, you know, that black and white kind of view. And he realizes, you know, something he never realized before. He didn't understand. He remembers the story. You know, it's not that he doesn't, no, it's just that this is the first time he really understands what happened to that kid and why the whole thing, and why he can't be allowed to be himself. And it is a devastating scene because it's not the good guy and the bad guy. It's just two human beings in a bad situation. And that's really what that kind of thing often is, you know, it, if you ask me, there are no bad people, there are just bad situations and, you know, people afraid to get out of those bad situations, but that's for an entirely different video. But yeah, I thought the film captured that beautifully, you know, you are not, you don't hate either of the people in the scene in spite of the fact that she is currently doing something horrible to him, and he has and will do horrible things. Let's lighten the mood a little bit. When he goes to, you know, have his tailor, to, to this tailor person, you know, and have the suit, there's this bit about how he apparently no longer has, you know, he has bad credit there or something like that. And, you know, it's, it's resolved because Tolston can, you know, he has some pull or he's from a good family, something like that, you know. I guess it was maybe before Hoover, as we see later, Hoover got more powerful and maybe also more rich. They, you know, they let me win, you know, at the racetrack. So maybe that it was before that. One thing, at, at first I was a little unsure of if they made a mistake and, you know, because he says, I don't sign my name, John, I don't remember exactly his explanation, but he says, that's not how I sign my name. And I'm not sure they had the last name with, or maybe it was the middle name that was missing, but I got to thinking maybe that was like one hint towards, well... If you don't have a system for identifying, you know, are these people are these actually different people? Then two people with similar names could be mistaken for each other. There could be two people with the same name or similar names, where that that they and they go to the same store and one of them has bad credit and the other does not and the other has to suffer for it. That could be it and that you know, and let's not forget. It is a good thing that we have this system for, you know, cataloging. It's, it's a tool. It can be abused. It is currently being abused. But it is not the tool that is inherently evil. Just because you can use a hammer to kill someone doesn't mean that a hammer is inherently a bad thing. You know, it's the wielder. And actually being able to keep track of criminals across state lines and... You know, being able to, you know, really, you know, have all this 
information about one person collected in one place. It, it really helps in the investigations of crimes, you know, and it is an incredible thing. But yeah, so maybe it's a hint that, you know, that was a good thing that he did for America and, you know, America later, you know, it's it spread to the rest of the civilized world. Or maybe, excuse me, maybe he did have bad credit. Excuse me, and maybe he lied. Even to himself, maybe he couldn't accept that he had bad credit because we see him through the movie. Maybe, maybe that was one of the early hints. You know, there are a couple of early hints that he is lying. You know, the, the thing with the white horse in the street, that did seem strange to me. But I didn't really think maybe he's lying about that. But then later, when they say, oh, there was never a white horse in the street, you think, of course there wasn't. Why did I even believe that for a second? But, you know, it is sort of this thing. You you sort of believe the lie along with him. You know, it's, it's um, I don't know, it's it's a good detail, maybe. It's like he's, yeah, there's there's just something to the story that is uh, appealing in some way. But, but yeah. And I thought that was also a great aspect of the film that you, you know, near the end actually find out that a lot of the positive details about himself and his work were made up by him because he needed to pre present a positive image of himself. He wanted adulation and he didn't get it and it tore him up. You know, he couldn't handle that. So th that was a really great, you know, aspect. Actually, You know, I, I think that it's very much about his mother. I, I think that one of the very earliest flashbacks, and the flashback that goes the furthest back, I suppose, when you see him as a child, and she tells him, you will be the most powerful man in the country, that messed him up. You know, it's, it's not good to have a parent that is just like, no, this will happen, and you are the most important thing in the entire world. You know, she really put that in his head, and it just, you know, when it, later on, he, yeah, you know, he wanted, he wanted adulation, maybe he wanted acceptance, you know, maybe he wanted to be able to be who he was, but since he couldn't, you know, and that led to the jealousy and the hatred, you know, he's, He's putting serious effort and seriously risking, you know, the FBI and not to mention just completely throwing integrity out the window just to keep Dr. King from accepting a Nobel Peace Prize. It's not, it's, it's not a, a, a position as secretary uh, of, you know... I don't know, what, you know, or senator, or, you know, some kind of politician. It's not outright power, it is just a sort of, it's, it's an accommodation, you know, it's, it's saying, we like what you've done here, you know, we like what you've done with the place. It's, and, and he can't handle that, because why should anyone get that if it's not him? Because he is the center of the universe, according to his mother. So it must be true, and just and and the words that he uses, the the bile, it is projection. You know, he is talking about himself or to himself, in a way. I I would say, you know, maybe I'm slightly overanalyzing. I'll you know, I'll admit that that maybe I am, but I I do think that it's motivated by self hatred. You know, he. He feels that he is a liar, and he is a liar, but uh, you know, not 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 intentionally harmfully. So I suppose you could say, he he just wants, uh, you know, his lies are in order to partially protect himself as far as the sexuality goes, and partially to uh, you know to maintain a some sort of positive self-image of himself because he can't handle all this rejection. He cannot handle that Lindy didn't even want to talk to him and thought he was annoying. He couldn't handle that he wasn't making those arrests and he could not handle that he might have been wrong. You know, when his, 
when, when it was questioned by, there, there was like a reporter mention, he tried, you know, he, he attacked him. He said, well, th I'm sure that guy has done something wrong. Let's, you know, book him. There, there's got to be something there because I did not make a mistake. I loved the, let's deal with the cross-dressing first, right after she's dead. You know, it's like, I, I suppose you could read some into it of him taking over for the mother in a sort of, and this is a spoiler for Psycho, but if you haven't watched Psycho, I don't know what rock you've been living under, but you need to crawl out from under it. Or maybe you've been living on Mars, whatever. Anthony, you know, not Anthony Perkins, but that's the actor. Anyway, Bates, Norman Bates and the mother, you know, mother. That kind of thing with the mother is the son's world, so when she dies, he has to take over her role. That could be part of it, and another could be she was the one telling him, you can't be yourself. So when she's gone, who's going to keep him from being himself? And I love that it is a, a conflict, because that is how it is. When there is something that you feel bad about doing, even though you so badly want to do it. That is exactly how you behave. And a lot of people are going to be able to recognize that. Just the, the, the look on his face, the, the tone of his voice, his words, it's the whole thing. He so badly wants both to reject this and to accept it with open arms. And he cannot, you know, he, he doesn't know how to handle that, you know, that Pitch perfect. Pitch perfect scene. And the, you know, him and Colton with, you know, at first they're just, they're, they're relaxing and they're, you know, enjoying themselves and each other's company. They're, they're just in, in the hotel room. They're clearly having, excuse me, a great time. And they are, they, they connect, you know, they really they just fit together. It is so clear. And Colton actually, because Colton can be honest with himself, and he can be honest with Hoover. He doesn't, you know, he, he could go out and tell the world, you know, I love him and we have a relationship, but he's not going to do that. Because he's not, he's not vindictive. He, he loves Hoover and he can be honest about it to himself and to Hoover. And Hoover can't handle that. Hoover can't be honest about his feelings for Colton. And really, in a way, he probably can't really be honest about Colton's feelings for him, him either. So his response is to try to push him away by asserting his supposed heterosexuality. And... And it frustrates Colton, and, and again, the whole scene is just, you know, fantastic. And, and Colton, it hits the nail on the head. You know, every word he says about Hoover is so terribly, terribly spot on. And just the fact that even after, after that scene, you know, the, the scene ends with this kind of, you know, he says, never speak of a woman that you've slept with again in my company, you know. Right after that, we cut to them as elderly at the racetrack. I think that was the racetrack. But yeah, you know, it, they are still together. It is that kind of thing of... They do love each other, and they really can't be without each other. I also loved the whole thing with the handkerchief. You know, the first part where he picks it up and gives it to Hoover, and Hoover quickly wipes his upper lip... And, you know, and it was no accident that he was exercising right before meeting him. You know, he wanted to look good for Colton. And, you know, just when, when he meets him, just immediately, you know, your suit looks great. What the heck are you wearing? Go buy another suit. Ask that guy how to get a good suit. You, can I have your card? You know, and he, he's like, okay, so 215 yearly applicants we've already rejected. We have 31 who can come in for an interview. 
hey, how about this Colton guy? Do we even have a letter from him? Okay, let's see. It says, you know, he doesn't really want to work for us. Okay, invite him in. I want to talk to him right away, you know. It's just, it's clear from the start. But yeah, the handkerchief, you know, the very last thing we see, the last moment we see between them is, you know, the handkerchief being pulled up. You know, Colton takes it, takes it up to his nose and just, and just, you can just see the longing. It, it's, it's, again, it's one of those scenes where you only see it once, but it just, it is an... As a sort of it's it's one example of so many of it's it's a tiny glimpse into a life where we realize that this has happened so many times there's no reason to even count them the same as with the mother you know telling him stop stammering and just you know speak normally and don't be uh, effeminate at all you know, the, just the, the longing of Colton for Hoover is just, you know, heartbreaking. But yeah, the, the entire scene with, you know, that, that and, and Hoover can't even handle, you know, Colton pointing out what he really is like. And Colton, I'm sure, takes no joy in it either. It's just he can't, you know, it's, it's his frustration, he's venting his frustration at the continued rejection by Hoover. You know, this utter lack of acceptance. Yeah, you know, I've already talked a bit about how Hoover kind of projects, you know, his self-hatred, so he, you know, he attacks others that, you know, I thought it was kind of funny how, you know, he's sitting there with this recording of, you know, JFK having sex and, you know, phone call and, oh, the president's dead. Oh, well, I guess I can't use this anymore, <laughs> you know. I suppose that pretty well covers it. Just a few more things. The him wanting adulation and not being able to handle, you know, basically real life completely. That you know, he was lying to everybody, including himself. Also, seen with you know the doctor that you know he can't handle having said out loud, bef you know, before his staff. Maybe you need a break, you know, you're an old man. I mean, I don't know exactly, but I guess at the time it must have been like 70 or 80, you know, around the time of Nixon as president. Yeah, that would seem to fit with his, you know, starting his career in the 20s as a 20-year-old-ish. Anyway, yeah, he, you know, he can't even accept that obvious fact, and it's because he can't handle, he doesn't trust anyone. That is also a major part of his character, the paranoia, which is also why he wanted, you know, dirt on anyone, even, you know, manufactured dirt, which, yeah, as you know, is never quite as good as that natural dirt, you know, any farmer will tell you that. You know, he... He doesn't trust anyone, so he doesn't choose a successor, you know. I, I think he tries to, you know, nominate Tolston, but Tolston is like, nah, I'd really rather not, because he probably, he wouldn't be able to keep up appearances. He wouldn't be able to, you know, keep people from realizing about his sexuality, because he wasn't as willing or determined to hide it from everyone, including himself, as Hoover was. But yeah, and the shots, you know, daily shots of something that was supposed to make him lose weight and give him more energy, that don't sound too good. That's really not a good situation to remain in. You know, if you're in a position where you feel like you have to take some kind of medication, you know, even if it is prescribed by a doctor, 
you probably would be better off trying to get out of that situation than just remaining on the medication for a prolonged amount of time. You know, when possible, of course, it's different if it's something that, you know, just needs treatment for a while. And then, but, yeah, that was not the situation. He was pushing himself too hard, and it doesn't matter how long he took this drug or, you know, even how often he took it, it's not a good situation to be in, and I don't know all the details, but I would imagine that's how, that's what eventually killed him, just exhaustion, you know, he pushed himself too hard, same as with Tolston, you know, and the, you know, the uh, desire for adulation, also seen in the, these comic books and radio programs and the stuff that he, he's selling, you know, and yeah, he was he was trying to push this image of he he wanted everyone to love him and what he was, and this whole thing he couldn't even handle that some you know one of his agents was on the toasty pops or whatever you know cornflakes cereal box and with a junior G man badge inside that was cute, and you know Tolston just that that was pretty funny, and he puts it down, and then, you know, when he's walking in, he picks it up and continues eating it. That was pretty funny. He can't even handle that. It was one of his agents. It was his, you know, he partially caused it, but he can't handle just this, you know, that, that other people are at all admired for something that, you know, he feels like he should he feels like he should get all and any credit for, you know, anything that he considers good, really. And especially something that he's involved in. You know, which is also why he makes up this lie of him being the one to, you know, arrest these various mobsters. I also like the sort of shift in, you know, early on, it's the mobster who's seen as the good guy, although the film really did seem slightly strange, he seemed more comical than, you know, like a gangster, but whatever, excuse me. But then, you know, later on, we see that it's the G-men who are, you know, the positives, and yeah, that was... A pretty nicely done thing, and that's also, I believe, accurate. That you know, originally it was a sort of flirtatious thing with like you know, people didn't like the government that much, and they were like, Hey, someone's fighting them, I'm all for it. And then you know, gradually it you know, did become the sort of thing where people were more appreciative of you know, the police and such you know, trying to fight the, you know, the criminals, organized and not so organized. Please rate and comment, and hey, if you like this video, that subscribe button's just waiting for you to click it.